Thank you so much for that introduction, Blake. Uh, and thank you so much to Gail uh, for the work that you're doing to hold Bush accountable for what he's doing. It's shocking, really, that he's getting away with war crimes and torture uh, in Guantanamo Bay and in Afghanistan. And I think that, that that work to hold him accountable is so important. And in many ways, we see how Harper is really advancing that same war on terror agenda. Uh, we see with his omnibus crime bill how he is putting forward these anti-terrorist laws that are going to discriminate against uh, people of color and you know we heard him say some outrageous statements like Islamicism is the biggest threat to Canadian security uh, and we know that you know it's only a government who is basing their policies on this dogma that could come up with a statement like that and it's really frightening, this culture of fear that he is instilling in order to justify these policies. Um, so, so thank you for the work you're doing. Um, and thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm absolutely honored to be here. I, I, yeah, I held up a sign in the Senate, as you know, to stop Harper. And I would love to talk a bit about uh, what motivated me to do that and as well about thinking outside the ballot box precisely uh, and what, what can we do in the context of a Harper majority government. I mean, it can be it can be very discouraging to think that we have four years of this conservative agenda, but there is actually a lot that we can do uh, when we mobilize. So I'd like to talk a bit about that too, and then I would love to have some kind of dialogue after uh, and exchange thoughts. Um, so just to start off, uh, as Blake mentioned, you know, I went to Ottawa with these big hopes of either becoming a politician or becoming a lobbyist of some sort. Um, I, I'm from Winnipeg originally and then I moved to Ottawa precisely to be part of the parliamentary page program and while being a page I really started to understand the parliamentary process, uh, see how it worked, uh, the committees and I really realized that change is not going to happen in Parliament. After the election of Harper, uh, where the majority of Canadians did not vote for him, 75% uh, of Canadians did not vote for Harper, yet he's still in government, that is testament to the fact that we have a very flawed democracy. <clears throat> and certainly Harper is not going to be stopped in Parliament given that even if all of the opposition parties vote against his agenda it will still go forward uh, which is one reason why he won't be stopped there but also because for the fundamental changes that we need uh, it's really going to be outside of Parliament that we see them and if we look historically, it's really been from the outside that we have seen uh, fundamental societal changes. And it's interesting because after the action, um, a lot of people from my parents' generation came, came up to me and said, you know, we were getting so discouraged about young people and their political engagement. And they, they were sort of surprised when I did that because they, they thought, you know, young people are sleeping. Uh, you know, look at the voter turnout. It was appalling. Um, it was one of the lowest ever in Canadian history for young people. Um, but I guess I'm here to say that young people are awake, uh, they're becoming awakened, and I think it's largely a myth that, that youth are apathetic. Um, I look at my friends and the young people around me who are so concerned with uh, the Harper agenda, um, with uh, 
war in Libya, with the destruction of our climate, with this growing inequality. They're deeply concerned about this. Um, and many of them, though, don't feel like the government uh, represents them. So they are taking other forms of action and doing grassroots kind of activism uh, in order to make, make changes. Um, and so I think that there is, we can draw a lot of hope from that. And uh, we're really seeing young people starting to, to mobilize with um, more seasoned uh, and experienced people. And I think that it's really through this intergenerational uh, movement that we're really going to make fundamental changes. And I think it's really important to stress that uh, democracy is more than a ballot box. It is not just voting every four years. It's really holding our government accountable every day and being critical of what the government is doing, you know, and not, not giving up uh, with any decision that the government makes. Um, I've been so inspired by Bolivia where whenever the government uh, makes a decision, people are mobilizing in the streets if they disagree with it and it's sort of become a habit and strikes are used so often to hold the government accountable and I think that we can learn a lot from from that um, and there are other uh, movements across the world that I think we can learn so much from um, in our society, we tend to, you know, see power in, in one way, and power in that in that sense, you know, operates from the top down. And we're told that it's only politicians and CEOs who have power, and ordinary people have no power to make change. Um, but I think that that is so far from the truth. And I think that it's really only when we start taking action that we see that we can, we can really have an impact when we find uh, creative ways to take action and when we join with others to really uh, strategically um, make change. And I think that that different understanding of power is so important. Um, and I look to people like uh, Jean Sharp and their consent theory of power, which shows that in order to have uh, the authority um, of a government to make decisions, that government is upheld by, by many different structures, um, including civil servants and including workers. And when people decide to revoke their consent and not obey uh, those policies of that government, then it, it gradually trip, chips away at the authority of that government and uh, chips away at their power and their ability to make certain changes. And I really think that we need to to think about uh, these different ways of understanding power and to think about the power we have as people uh, when we join together and we refuse to, to obey um, a government that we, we don't agree with. Um, and this, this has worked in many different uh, areas. You know, we saw with Gandhi, for example, and their struggle for independence. Uh, we saw with the civil rights movement, people taking direct action, you know, becoming the change that we, they wanted to see. And I think these alternative uh, means can be very useful in a time like this when we have a conservative majority who has such a, a stronghold. Um, or we perceive that at least. And, and I think another thing that's so important is this, this sense of fear of, of speaking out um, and sort of this delegitimization of, of activism by, by the mainstream. Um, but I really think that it has to do with those in power who are trying to keep their power. And it's so important to challenge that on a regular basis uh, so that we can reclaim power to, to us and to the people. 
and and I really think that it's it's when we come together that we become much stronger and that we are capable of really shifting um, public discourse and I really think it's the, the job of us um, and the job of social movements to to make that shift from what is politically possible right now um, to shifting that into what we, we really want. So shifting what we want into what is politically possible and getting rid of any kind of false solutions that the government is, is putting forward. And so, yeah, I guess I would, I would end by saying that despite, you know, a four-year majority, there is so much that we can do and there are so many nonviolent means that we can take action. And I think that that is our challenge for the next four years. And, yeah, and I look forward to, to working with, with you for, on this. Mm -hmm.